Last week, tennis legend Chris Everett announced she has ovarian cancer. Now, it was diagnosed early, discovered at stage 1C after a preventive hysterectomy. Everett carries a mutation of a high-risk gene. Her sister died from ovarian cancer two years ago. This news has put the spotlight back on the risk factors and the treatment for ovarian cancer. Joining us now is Dr. Joe Marie Tranjanko of Scripps MD Anderson Cancer Center to answer some of these questions. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to sharing some information with you and your audience. Absolutely. So as I just mentioned, Chris Everett has family history. She carries mutation of the BRCA gene. How much does that raise somebody's risk? So depending on what variant in the BRCA gene, what mutation a particular person carries, it can increase the risk from a general population risk of about 2% in your lifetime of developing ovarian cancer to, I believe she has BRCA1, which is the highest risk variant, to about 40%, 20 to 40% lifetime risk. So a very significant increase. And obviously family history, if you or close to your family, except for those people maybe who are adopted and don't know their history, um, is important to keep track of. What about the history of infertility? Is that an issue? That's a great question. There are known risk factors. So gene mutation, family history plays into that. And it's important to gather that information if it's available to you and request a genetic counseling referral from your primary care physician or have a discussion with your doctor if that's appropriate because that information can be very empowering as we see in her case. And I really applaud her bravery in sharing her story and how knowledge really is power and can lead to an earlier diagnosis or ways to prevent ovarian cancer. Some of the other risk factors that are sometimes raised like infertility are a little bit harder to parse out because we know that reproductive history plays a role in ovarian cancer risk. Not being pregnant um, does somewhat increase the risk, not as much as family history or mutations, but somewhat. And really figuring out whether infertility truly raises that risk or whether it's a matter of not being pregnant and having more ovulatory cycles with the ovary and causing changes in the ovaries that way, it's a little hard to parse out. So I see gene mutations, family history as a bigger risk factor than infertility. What about things like age or somebody's race? How important are those factors? Also a good thing to bring up. So like many cancers, the risk increases with age. Average age of diagnosis of ovarian cancer is in the 60s, and we tend to see it more often in white women than in women of other ethnic backgrounds. But that being said, I treat patients from all different walks of life and backgrounds and all different ages. So I think knowing about family history, but also being aware of some of the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer and knowing that anybody really can be at risk is a really important point to know about for your audience. Um, there's this misconception that ovarian cancer is a silent disease, but it isn't. We've actually studied this and women from many stages, early to late, do have symptoms when you look back and, and see over the past few months preceding their diagnosis what's really been going on. Now those symptoms can be vague. They're things like abdominal bloating, pelvic pain or discomfort, urinary urgency or frequency. And there are many other non-cancerous conditions that cause these symptoms. but with ovarian cancer, we notice that they tend to become more frequent and persistent, occurring about 10 to 12 times a month. So I think having that awareness that those symptoms could be associated with ovarian cancer, having a conversation with your physician if you are experiencing those symptoms is really critical. And we know that Chris Everett is undergoing chemo. What are the preferred treatments at this point? That's a great question. And as a GYN oncologist, um, there are many treatments available what treatments are appropriate for an individual woman really depends on the stage of her ovarian cancer, what particular subtype, because there are actually several different kinds of ovarian cancer, um, as well as you know, where she is in her treatment process. Oftentimes surgery is a starting point and maybe the only point of treatment for some women. Oftentimes chemotherapy or other targeted treatments are involved. We have a lot of really great new options, even over the past six to 10 years that I've been practicing, I've seen huge changes and we are really curing more patients with ovarian cancer and helping women live longer with their disease as well. So there are a lot of exciting things going on. I will say it's really important for women with a concern for an ovarian cancer diagnosis or a new diagnosis to be treated at a comprehensive cancer program like, like Scripps Clinic or Scripps MD Anderson Cancer Center 
and to have a GYN oncologist who's a subspecialty surgeon who's trained in women's cancer care involved in their care from the beginning. Uh, we know that women do better in a multidisciplinary program and with GYN oncologists involved. It is great to hear that treatments are getting better and better. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jo Marie Tranjanko of Scripps MD Anderson Cancer Center. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.